You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit ftserussell.com, cboe.com, and cmegroup.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means we are back once again for TWIFO this week in Futures Options, a program where we break down all of the action over there at CME Group. So we're going to talk about, you never know what products are going to make it on the show every week. You got to tune in. Maybe it's ags, maybe it's metals, maybe it's crypto, maybe it's FX, maybe it's equities, energy. You never know. You got to tune in every week to find out. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever exciting network upon which so many of you are binging these days. Remember, if you're on the on demand side, you like what you hear, all we ask is that you keep rating and reviewing. It does help all the new folks continue to discover the network, and indeed, they are legion. And of course, if you want to go above and beyond, you want to get this show live in your ear holes, everything else we do. Live in your ear holes, as well as, of course, exclusive content coming at you a couple times a week, as well as giveaways and a whole bunch of other fun stuff. Theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go. And, of course, we welcome all of you out here with your questions and comments. Keep sending those in. You know where to find us at Options on most of the major social media platforms. It's probably the easiest way to get at us. Questions at theoptionsinsider.com. Also works if you're one of the cool cats in the secret club. You can ask your questions live. You always get bumped to the top of the list. And let's see who's joining me on the old TWIFO program today. Holding down the CME Group and FTSE, Russell Hot Seat, our old friend, Mr. Todd Colvin, the Senior Vice President of Global Institutional Sales and Business Development over there at Ambrosino Brothers. Todd, welcome back to the TWIFO program, sir. Well, thank you, Mark. It's great to be back Uh there's a lot going on in these markets, uh, and there's more to come in the days and weeks ahead. So uh, great to be here. Yes, a lot to get to. So why don't we do it? Let's kick it off the way we always do. It is time for the Movers and Shakers reports. 
It's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the Movers and Shakers Report. All right, everybody, welcome to the Movers and Shakers Report. This is indeed the portion of the show where we break down everything lighting it up to the light side, a.k.a. the upside, and to the dark side over there at CME this week. If you guys want this report in your hot little hands, you know where to go. If you follow us at Options on Twitter or if indeed if you follow CME Group, they will always tweet it out immediately ahead of the show every week. That's one of the few premium reports you guys can get access to for free over there from the folks at Bantix. Of course, if you like these products, if you listen to this show, you owe it to yourself to go check out the full offering over there at Bantix.com. B-A-N TIX.com is the place to go to dive deep into Quick Strike and all the other cool stuff they have to offer over there. All right, Mr. Todd, you know the deal now. Where should we begin our journey this week, to the light side or to the dark side, sir? Mark, let's take a look at the light side to start things off today. All right, that's a good choice because this chart is mostly green. <laughs> Looks like we have – we could probably do a bottom – we could probably do a bottom 12 maybe. But that would be kind of stretching things. Everything else is pretty much green this week, listeners. Uh, let's see. Number five to our upside movers this week, we have uh, the E-mini NASDAQ up 5.85%. Is that the only equity leading the charge this week? Heck no. A lot more equities in the green this week. Number four, the E-mini mid-cap S&P 400. Don't talk about that too often. Up 5.98%. Is that the top equity? Nope. It has been usurped by our old friend, the Russell 2000, up 6.32% this week. Quite the banger week for small caps. Maybe we'll head out there this week as well. Number two, one of our top three frequent offenders. Usually any given week, if you guess one of these three products, there's a good chance you will be right. This week, coming in at number two to the light side, we have Bitcoin. Up 9.45%. It was number six in the other direction last week, off nearly 7%. So quite a rock'em, sock'em couple of weeks for Bitcoin. And number one with a with an enormous bullet here, a freaking 357, we have a natural gas exploding to the upside, up 22.18%. It was number one in the same direction last week, up 7.35%. So it has been number one to the upside for two weeks. Nat Gas, one of our other frequent offenders here. So we have in our light side this week, two of our three frequent offenders dominating the tape. Can we find our other one, which is lumber to the dark side? Let's find out. Number five to the dark side listeners. Oh, it's lumber (laughs) off 5.78%. So it is another rare week listeners where we have all three members of the triumvirate present in our movers and shakers this week followed by number four out to the beans again this time it is soybeans off 11.5 percent followed by number three still hanging out in the beans soybean meal off 12.41 percent it was number two in the same direction last week off 5.81 percent number two is the euro dollars off 13.45 percent it was number three in the same direction last week, off 7.8%. And number one to the dark side this week, once again, hanging out in the ags, it is corn, off 16.01%. So a rough week for the green stuff, a strong week for the sticky stuff, and a whole bunch of other fun stuff like the equities having a good week as well. But I think because it is one of our frequent movers and shakers, Todd, and because it is dominating our light side yet again, we have to start in energy first. It's time to tap into the deep options well of black gold, Texas tea, nat gas, and more. It's time to talk energy. All right, everybody. Welcome to the world of energy. You know where to go. Drop into that drop down over there at cmegroup.com slash twifo, T-W-I-F-O. Uh, pull up that drop down for the asset class. You're going to go down three to energy, over to product family, over three more to nat gas, and then we're going to hang out there first. Uh, Mr. Todd, a lot's been going on in the world of energy. You got the Texas tea. You have the Nat gas. What's lighting up your tape in the energy segment this week, sir? Well, you can't go anywhere without hearing about this Nat gas story. It's just not going away. Uh, it's the middle of summer. Typically, we talk about you know the Nat gas peaks coming in the midst of winter when we're shoveling ourselves out of however, whatever snowstorm we, we happen to find ourselves in. But really, Nat gas, you know, it peaked in June. 
so, so supposedly peaked in June, uh, sold off down to July, got just above five bucks. And all of a sudden we're rallying again because these heat waves are cranking the AC, uh, not to mention the supply issues, which are going to continue. So a lot of fundamentals here, basic fundamentals driving that gas. Right now it is that old supply versus demand equation that we learned about in eighth grade. It is still there and it's still working and took us off the lows and I got to be honest, looking at these neck ass moves, I, I don't know why you'd want to be be short anything here. I mean, it, it's a winner on one day and a loser the next uh, in your face. So I think at this point, neck ass, you just got to sit back and watch. Uh, it is a very volatile contract and it, it isn't going to slow down anytime soon. Has all this volatility, has this gotten a lot of clients interested in that gas over there? Or are they kind of like it, you mentioned, is it almost too much vol? They want to take their ball and go too home? much. This is almost a too much vol. Uh, there are certain strategies that you can put on which help mitigate that, but ultimately, uh, net gas is is not for the uh, the introducing client. It is more for the seasoned traders, and it is uh, it's going to continue to trade all over the place. Summer is, like I said, is usually the time when net gas bottoms out. I mean, we I remember summers where net gas was three or four bucks, and it just sat in these ranges. And you know, we haven't been below five bucks. Uh, going back, uh, you know, going back at least a year. So at this point, we've got, you know, very, very high sensitive price movements. And if you're not in that gas up to your eyeballs, you need to stand back and just watch this one. These are no markets for the timid. That is sure. Yeah. <laughs> if you, you're right. If you're not uh, pre- pretty well versed and steeped in that gas, listeners, maybe a good time to be on the sidelines a little bit. We have had Carly on recently, Carly Garner, who said something similar along those lines. She's been run over a little bit to the upside here in some of this uh, madness. Easy thing to do in that gas these days. Listeners, speaking of what's going on out here in that gas, another pretty active week, 460,000 contracts on the tape out here this week. Listeners, that's a pretty active week. And of that, about 36% going up in the contract, the odd contract that has, Oh, a whopping five days to go. So let's see if we can find a contract that is also active that has a little bit more meat on the bone. You know what? The rest of the contracts are pretty evenly split. So let's go out to September. That has 36 days to go. And by the way, that gas, that front future, a little over 8, 8.05. If we get out to September, that future at a 793 Right now, the September future, the September September contract has done about 12% of the paper this week. So the second most active contract out here this week. Uh, The vol out here, almost a 94, 93.90. That's off about half a point this week. That front contract going away in five days, the vol out there is an 86. Uh, In terms of skew this week, the puts 3.7. They were last week, I should say, 3.7% cheap. This week, 5.1% cheap. So the puts getting a little bit cheaper this week. Probably understandably so. Uh, and the calls last week, 9.3% bid. This week, 8% bid. So the call's coming in a wee bit as well. In terms of action, what was the most active contract out here this week? Well, once again, listeners, we are back in the realm of talking about the 10 calls. It was the 10 calls in August going out in about five days that were just lighting up the tape this week. 20,600 of those bad boys going up this week. Pretty active all week long. The most active day was today, 9,300 today, about 8,000 yesterday, 2,000 on Monday, 1,100 on Tuesday, pretty much closing all week. So it looks like some folks may be deciding we're not going to get to 10 (laughs) in the next five days, either that or they're just blasting away at that strike to harvest what little premium is left before that contract goes the way of the dodo. Either way, 20,600 of these 10 calls trading it up for size this week, listeners. Followed by number two, it was the eight calls. That makes a little bit more sense. That is pretty much the at-the-money strike right now. They traded about 14,400 of those this week. The busiest day was yesterday, 5,700, followed by 4,600 today, 2,300 on Monday, 1,600 on Tuesday. Back and forth, opening to closing all week, which makes some sense as we were flirting with this strike and blowing past it and dripping below it. Uh, makes some sense if folks would be opening and closing around the at the money strike. And then follow right behind that, we have the nine calls. So kind of a bit of a call strip, eight, nine to 10 listeners. Uh, the nine calls did nearly 13,000 contracts this week. The busiest day was Wednesday, uh, 4,500 contracts, 4,300 today, 2,300 on Monday, 1,400 on Tuesday. So they all have one thing in common is that Tuesday was a kind of a light day for all three of those calls. 
looks like mostly closing on the nine calls this week as well. So uh, intriguing stuff, kind of a heavy, heavy call strip trading pretty actively here in August. Let's go a little bit beyond that, see if we find anything farther out that may be of interest here. Listeners, looks like a lot of seven calls were trading across the board here too in July of next year, in August of next year, and in September of next year. The seven calls doing about 3,500 contracts each, also trading in October 3,500 times about as well. So maybe it looks like a bit of a calendar. They were trading actively all week actually. It's, it is strange that the exact same number, 3,425, would go up in September and in October, so it looks like a bit of a calendar. Yeah, it looks it's far too coincidental for it not to be related paper listeners. And it looks like, yeah, it looks like maybe a SEP or an August SEP. Actually, no, it's a July, August, September, October seven call. It's not even a calendar at that point when you have four months. It's more of a say, uh, calendar strip, if you will, <laughs> uh, going up 3,425 times. Uh, interesting. Uh, let's see any other funky strikes lighting it up out here. Uh, looks like that's kind of the lion's share of the weird stuff this week. Uh, before we drop out of energy really quickly, Mr. Todd, I'm sure a lot of your clients have been watching WTI. Anything catching your eye out there in the realm of oil this week, sir? Well, WTI is also seeing its 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 share of ranges, um, but really we use WTI if you're not trading it, it's a great barometer for watching expectations for the global economy as a whole. And looking at price price action, you know, lately we've been hovering around this hundred dollar mark, and then we see these big moves lower. So, you know, right now it hasn't given away its hand totally, but the fact that we're well off those highs and the fact that we're seeing, uh, you know, continued pressure to the downside suggests that markets starting to fear this global recession uh, that may be coming. In the in the coming quarters, uh, on the heels of a lot of these central banks raising rates, so not necessarily uh, you know looking at specific areas to trade it, but looking at it from a macro perspective as an indicator. Let's do a quick hit here in WTI. Not the most active of weeks for WTI. Only two hundred ninety five thousand contracts on the tape. Usually we see around four hundred thousand on a decently active week. Of that, thirty six percent coming in the September contract has about twenty seven days to go. A WTI right around ninety six and a half right now. Listeners up nearly two percent uh, since Monday's session. The ball out here a little bit shy of fifty forty nine and a half off about two and a half points on the week. Uh, the skew this week. Uh, 3.6% bid to the puts. Last week, they were 4.3% bid. So coming in a little bit, the calls last week, 2.5% cheap. This week, 3.1% cheap. So the calls getting a little bit cheaper this week. In terms of action, we've got the 110 calls. I said we're at about 96.5. The 110 calls in September leading the dance this week with seven. Actually, I take it back. It was the 135 calls in December doing a whopping 17,000 contracts. That sounds like it's a vertical and looks like it is. Listen, again, one of these weirdly tight 134, 135 verticals went up on Monday. 15,000 of the 134s and 17,500 of the 135s. It is not a roll, listeners, <coughs> Excuse me, because they're opening on both legs. And once again, the one strike wide funky vertical. It's more of a, again, a strip at that point. You're probably just buying both or selling both. Uh, but again, this is not the first time we've seen these one point wide kind of uh, spreads slash strips here, which, again, is something that's kind of unique to the uh, to the upside in some of these futures options here. We don't see that as much in, let's say, the world of traditional equity options. Uh, but uh, interesting stuff nonetheless here. Let's see if we see any other weird paper out here. That's kind of the weirdness. If we get weirdness. If we get beyond that, again, the 110 calls in September are, in terms of traditional activities, the most active this week, 7,300 of those. Uh, the big day was Monday, about 3,000. 2,100 today, 1,800 on Tuesday, and about 300 and change on Wednesday. Back and forth, opening to closing all week long. All right, Todd, we, we did a little foray into energy. Uh, where should we head next on the show, sir? Well, we talked about it, you talked about it in the opening on the light side. Let's look at some of those equities. I had a feeling you were going to say that, sir. Let's go out to the equities next. It's time to explore the volatility swings, skew changes, and hot options trades in your favorite indices. It's time to talk equities. All right, everybody, welcome to the world of equities. You guys know where to find this in your drop down pop out of energy. You're going to go down one slot to equity indexes. 
And then we have kind of an embarrassment of riches this week. We have the NASDAQ 100 up nearly 6% on the week. The S&P mid-cap 400 also up nearly 6%. And, of course, the Russell 2000 up 6.3%. So a lot of action in the equities this week. Mr. Todd, what is lighting up your tape in the world of equities this week, sir? Well, we, we keep a close eye on those e-minis. They tend to give you a pretty good uh, a pretty good look at what the market's doing as a as sort of a macro picture. You know, at this point, volatility in the in the e-minis has has kind of I don't want to say cratered, but it hasn't really seen any any real peaks and valleys. It's really been just sitting in a valley. Uh, given the fact that we've seen all these shifts from the Federal Reserve, given expectations for for earnings that maybe that come in on the high side or maybe less weak in some of these cases. Uh, volatility hasn't really batted an eye. Uh, and as typically as we see equities rally, volatility comes off. That's a pretty inverse relationship that stands the test of time. But ultimately, given the uncertainty of what we're looking down the road, maybe even a quarter or two, uh, volatility seems relatively cheap here. Let's see what kind of vol we are seeing out there. Like we said, we have a lot of equities lighting it up this week. Let's start somewhere we don't get a chance to talk about a lot, but it's lighting it up this week. It is the NASDAQ 100. Let's go on out there first. Uh, the NASDAQ 100 coming into the show today, 12603, up nearly 5% just since Monday session. So a rock'em sock'em week here for all things tech-heavy NASDAQ. A pretty active week, 135,000 contracts on the tape for the e-mini NASDAQ. Of that, of course, the front contract that has one day to go has done exactly a third of the paper. Uh, we are not going to hang out there. By the way, it is the 12,500 calls that are leading the dance there, if you are so inclined, listeners. 5,300 of those have gone up this week. We've got a little bit beyond that, listeners. Let's go out to the August contract, excuse me, the September contract. That did 18% of the paper this week. And let's see, that contract the vol is about a 27 and a half that's off nearly about looks like about a full point about one point this week in terms of skew by the let's see 14.3 percent bid with the puts last week 15 percent bid this week the calls last week 11.1 percent cheap this week 12.4 percent cheap and the action out here in september was again the 12,500 calls that's a popular strike 5,300 going up expiring tomorrow and in September, we have 2,100. The big day was Wednesday with about 1,800 today. The rest kind of scattered throughout the week. By the way, before I keep rolling, got so excited with the equities, I forgot to set the table from a vol perspective. So we're going to do that right now here, listeners, in terms of what's going on out here in the equities landscape. RVX, so the VIX of the Russell 2000, about a 28.55 when we kicked off the show, down nearly three points from where it was this time last week. In terms of VIX itself, so the S&P 500 at the money vol with some skew thrown in there, 23 and about a half. That's down about 380 from where it was this time last week. A VVIX, 84.43. That's down about 7.4 points from where it was this time last week. VVIX, of course, the volatility of volatility. A vol Q, so the vol of the NASDAQ, about a 27.81. Not that far away from what we were just talking about there in terms of the SEP vol for NASDAQ. That's down about 4.6 points from last show. That puts the VIX to RVX, so the S&P to small cap vol spread a little bit north of 5, about 5.1. That's almost nine-tenths of a point wider than it was this time last week. And the VIX to vol Q, so the S&P to NASDAQ vol spread about a 440. That's about eight-tenths of a point tighter than it was this time last week. So vol kind of moving around a little bit this week. Let's hop out, out of the NASDAQ now. Let's go up to our old friend's. The Russell 2000, that's just going to be two notches below the NASDAQ 100. Pretty active week, about 20-odd thousand contracts here in the, Na- the Russell 2000, even though it's not the, not the most active week we've seen out here. Uh, once again, like most equities, 27% of that paper going out in one day. <laughs> let's go a little bit farther out. Let's go out to the Ju- – let's go out to – let's see. Let's go out to the July – that only has eight days to go. Let's go a little bit farther out there. Let's go. Here we go. Let's go out to the uh, week three August contract that did about 23% of the paper. Uh, S&P, I should say the Russell 2000 right now, listeners, 1822, up 77 handles or four, almost four and a half percent just since Monday session. So quite the run across a lot of the equities this week. Uh, the vol out here this week, 2662, off about a third of a point in terms of skew. Last week, the puts 11.8% bid this week. 13.5% bid, and the calls 9.3% cheap last week, 11.7% cheap this week. 
And in terms of most active contracts, it looks like it's the 1780 puts going out tomorrow, doing about 600 contracts. That was the lion's share of the paper, followed behind that by the end of month July, 15 half puts. That's an interesting strike. Looks like they did a 15 half, 15 quarter put spread about 400 times on Monday. It was like they were taking it off, so they were closing out that put spread. Interesting. I guess maybe the rally, they're thinking uh, we're not going to get down there anymore. They're obviously taking their short put profits or they're taking off their long puts. Well, not much juice left on those at this point, but uh, getting what they can left out of those bad boys. And also have these 16 half puts going up in August about 300 times this week where the action was. All right, so intriguing stuff here. In the world of equities, outside of that, Todd, what other complexes are lighting up your tape this week, sir? Well, I I don't think it can go go much further. You you can look at some of these currencies, which have been all over the board, uh, hitting some pretty remarkable levels over the last week. The dollar, the euro, the yen, and more. It's time to explore what's happening in major currency options around the world. It's time to talk FX. Uh, speaking specifically, looking over at that euro, which had a big move since the last cu- in the last couple of days, but also breached a very important level, and that's it traded below parity versus the dollar, uh, and then was able to recover slightly after the ECB meeting. How great uh, is that? Today. I wish I was traveling in Europe right now, Todd. <laughs> We'd be millionaires. Yes, it, everything would be a nickel for us. It'd be like it'd be like just uh, old times again. Just everything. It would cost be. nothing. I mean, the dollar at 20 year highs, uh, it, you know, and we haven't we haven't seen this kind of price action. It's also with the pound, too. It's it's really uh, the strength of the dollar here is is really just taken over. And with the fact that these central banks in Europe are a little bit behind in their rate uh, hike cycles than, say, the Fed. Uh, and they have some other issues internally. Uh, clearly, the currencies are telling the tale of the tape. And and right now, uh, you know, volatility, which had been moving pretty strongly to the upside in the euro, seems to have come off a little bit after the event, which is very typical uh, of any of any asset class. Well, we don't get a chance to hang out in FX too often, listeners, but we're going to do it this week. Pop out of equity indices, go down one slot to foreign exchange. Uh, then we're going to go to the FX majors, and we're going to hang out in uh, Euro USD, as you might imagine, because that's where a lot of the action was, and actually a pretty active week. 58,000 contracts on the tape for Euro USD this week, so nothing to sneeze at out here this week. And of that, looks like this is kind of like an equity. There's so many, <laughs> so many very near dated contracts going away. But of that, 35 and a half percent of that nearly 60,000 contract listeners going up in the uh, looks like week one August contract that has about 15 days to go. So we're going to hang out out there, listeners. Uh, the vol, by the way, if you're wondering, this you mentioned we we're just below parity, we're still hanging out right around parity 1.02 right now is where that Euro USD spread is hanging out. Man, I wish I was just doing the tour of Europe right now, listeners. Instead, I'm talking to you here from the Southern Studio. In terms of vol, you know, the FX landscape has never really been synonymous with volatility, and that remains the case again this week. 12 and a quarter is where we're hanging out in the Euro USD, off about half a point. In terms of skew last week, the put 7.6% bid. This week, 7.9% bid, so... Getting a little bit more juice in the puts and the calls last week, 5.1% cheap. This week, getting a little bit cheaper, 5.5% cheap. And let's see, of that nearly 60,000 contracts, let's see, what was the lion's share? I love the strikes out here, by the way, listeners. They're all pretty much based around that, you know, that parody concept. So you're, you're going to see a below or above that one level. And here we are right now. Looks like the biggest, most active contract this week was not in that front contract. We're going to go out a little bit, actually, to the contract going away in 50 days on September 9th in particular. It was the 0.97 puts doing 2,283 contracts. The big day was Tuesday, 1,600, and then the rest were kind of scattered throughout the week. It was opening pretty much all week long, so that kind of what you were talking about earlier, Todd, with how we were flirting with getting below parity. Uh, some folks were trading it up on these 0.97 puts here this week. Listeners, if we get beyond those, let's see any other big prints. Uh, The 1.06 calls going up in March of next year did about a thousand contracts this week. 1.0125 puts 
did about 1,700 contracts this week. That's in the, uh, again, going back to August, the first week of August contract that has about 15 days to go. Let's see, those puts did about 1,700 contracts, almost all of that on Monday, 1,600 on Monday, and then about 100 on Tuesday and not much else the rest of the week. So a big opening chunk of uh, 1.0125 puts going up on Monday here on this, this August week one contract. So a lot of funky paper here, as you would expect, listeners, given the kind of action out there. You guys, have you guys been lured to FX by this, this kind of unprecedented action in the dollar, listeners? Has this made it more attractive to you? you know, normally, FX isn't the most exciting place to be slinging options. But these days, we're getting a little bit of action out here, listeners, which uh, makes things a little bit more intriguing. Hit us up. Let us know if you guys are, are slinging yourselves a little bit of the old uh, FX out here. All right, Todd, I know this is your favorite complex, uh, so I'll spear you on this one for a second. But because it is our number one dark side mover, we got to kind of hang our hat out in corn. Next. It's time to get our hands dirty exploring the latest options, trades, and trends in corn, wheat, soybeans, and more. It's time to talk eggs. All right, everybody, welcome to the dark side of eggs this week in particular. We're going to go to corn. You know, it's an alphanumeric order, so <laughs> it's uh, ags are top of the list, listeners. Pretty easy to find. And then you're going to go over to grains and oil seeds, and also you're going to find corn. So stay right at the top of that list. Corn, of course, the big dogs in the ag complex. 495,000 contracts on the tape this week, so a pretty active week. Corn, by the way, if you're wondering, coming in at $575, off nearly 30 bucks this week, or just 4.85% just this week alone. So... They are coming for corn this week, and of that, uh, nearly 500,000 contracts, about a third going up in the Dece contract that has 127 days to go. We're going to hang out out there, and let's see. In that contract, the vol, if you are wondering, it's about a 38, up about half a point. So if you're in the Todd camp, you think equity vol is maybe a little bit too light, well, then uh, corn saying, hey, look at me, a 38. You know, you're talking over a 10-point premium to a lot of the equity vol. We were just talking about listeners. So uh, intriguing stuff out here in the ags. In terms of skew, a 7.4% cheap last week, 8.7% cheap this week. So the puts are coming in. The calls last week, 8.6% bid. And this week, 7.8% bid. In terms of the action, like I said, nearly half a million contracts on the tape. Looks like the big dog this week, the 700 calls in December. Trading pretty actively all week long, about 4,700 on Monday, 4,800 on Tuesday, 4,700 on Wednesday, 3,200 today. A back and forth opening to closing all week long. And it looks like right behind that we have the 650 calls uh, trading about 14,000 contracts this week. The big day for those is today, 5,300, 3,800 on Wednesday, 3,600 on Monday, and about 1,000 on Tuesday. Again, back and forth opening to closing all week long. On both of these bad boys. And also, not to be outdone, we have the 800 calls in December doing about 13,000 contracts. Uh, the big day was Tuesday, about 4,500, 3,400 on 3,400 going up today. And then the rest kind of scattered throughout the week. Also opening and closing throughout the week here. Uh, Todd, I know you're not the biggest ag guy, but have any of your clients been calling you guys up interested in the ags given how much movement we've seen over the past couple of months? Well, when those when the corn prices were getting close to eight dollars, and you saw uh, wheat getting up near thirteen, it caught everybody's eye. But since then, it's been a, a, a real collapse in price. Uh, you know, corn down twenty some percent. You've got wheat down thirty five percent. Yeah, we've seen a little bit of a bounce back in wheat, but corn's still struggling. And you know, a lot of this can be attributed to uh, either whether it's liquidation, preservation of capital, uh, or whether it's you know looking for other opportunities, but it's it's again it's a good macro look at at where some of the money is flowing to and from and in this case it looks like they're running out of ags after seeing that big run up uh in the spring well todd i know you're also a big rates guy so i think we can hang our hat out there next the fed the yield curve inflation fears how are they impacting options activity and volatility in your favorite interest rate products Let's find out as we explore the world of rates. All right, everybody, welcome to the world of rates. Get into that drop down. Go from ags, go all the way down to the second from the bottom there, 
interest rates and go out into U.S. rates. And then we can hang our hat anywhere we want in there. We have, of course, the euro dollars, which are on our movers and shakers this week at number two. To the dark side, of course, there are other places we can hang our hat as well. Ten-year, 30-year. Mr. Todd, what is lighting up your tape in the world of rates this week, sir? Well, I think there's a couple, but I think you always want to start with the tenure. It's sort of the, the benchmark, and it, and it really sets the tone. And, and volatility really made a, a, a big move higher. Uh, you know, when we go back to the prior to the June FOMC and the quick turnaround by the Fed to say, hey, we're, gonna, we're not going to raise 50 in June. We're, we're, the market told us it was going to raise 75, and that was the ultimate uh, rate hike. Things started to get a little dicey when you're, when you're talking about a Fed that's shrinking its balance sheet. And, and not purchasing the, the the treasuries that it had been, and that sort of threw a wrench. And we saw yields get way up there, like almost at three three point five. Now we're back at three percent. And while volatility is down slightly this week, it is still elevated to where we've seen it over the last several years, and remains elevated. And I think will until we get through this rate hike cycle, the growth versus inflation t- tug of war we're seeing from the Fed, as well as some clarity. Uh, on where this economy is going. I was just scrolling through the rates complex while you were talking, Todd. Kind of a light week from a volume perspective. Euro dollar is not even breaking a million, 883,000. Can't remember the last time we saw euro dollars that light. And the 10 year, you were just talking about, Todd, a decently active week, about 1.6 million contracts. It may sound like a lot, but for the 10 year, doing under 2 million is kind of light, actually. So not a rock'em sock'em week for the rates from a volume perspective, but to the 10 year, we will go. You're right, it is kind of the the benchmark there, Todd. And I said, even though it's a quiet week, still almost 1.6 million contracts on the tape. So uh, doing a lot more than a lot of the other complexes we were just talking about combined. Of that, we're going out to the SEP contract. Looks like nearly half of that paper, 49.4% of that about 1.6 million contracts going up. And the SEP contract has about 36 days to go. So we're going to hang out out there, listeners. Uh, the 10-year, if you're not following listeners, is at about a 118 and a quarter Coming into the start of the show, so kind of unched on the week. Not a big mover week for the 10-year. In terms of vol, again, you don't go to the 10-year usually for vol, and that remains the case again this week. A 7.83 is the vol, so <laughs> well below 10. That's off another third of a point, so the vol is getting cheaper out here, listeners. In terms of the skew, 3.1% bid were the puts last week, 4.1% bid this week. The calls, 1.4% cheap this week. Two and a half percent cheap. So let's see. Uh, let's see where the size paper is going up this week, listeners. It is in the one sixteen and a half puts out here in September that we're doing some paper this week. Eighty eight thousand contracts to be precise, and pretty much all of that going up on Tuesday. Sixty three thousand five hundred eighty nine going up on Tuesday, mostly opening. Then we did thirteen thousand today. Seventy five hundred on Wednesday. 3,600 on Monday, but the big dog day, obviously, Tuesday, just dominating the tape there, listeners. And then right behind that, we have the 118 puts going out tomorrow. So there is some near-dated paper going up, almost like an equity here, listeners. One-day paper to go. 73,000 of the 118 puts going up this week. Uh, These were a little bit more spread out. Uh, They did 21,500 on Wednesday 17,500 on Monday and Tuesday, and 16,600 today. It looks like mostly closing throughout the week on these 118 puts. So a pretty active stuff there. Then we drop to number three here. We've got, actually, no, let's go back out to the one day to go contracts. It looks like it was also on the call side. Yeah, 60,000 of the 118 and a half calls going up this week. Uh, 31,000 today, <laughs> 16,500 on Wednesday, 10,000 on Tuesday, and about just remnants going up on Monday. Uh, so yeah, 60,000 total on the week. It looks like back and forth opening to closing. We don't have the numbers for today, but uh, intriguing stuff here in the 10 year. You don't usually see that kind of near dated paper going up all the time out here, let alone what we saw here this week, listeners. And then, Todd, we're kind of we're cranking through all the complexes this week. I like it. I know you're a bit of a metalhead. So maybe we'll hand out there next. Werewolves beware. It's time to explore the options activity in silver, gold, and other shiny things. It's time to talk metals. 
All right, listeners, let's get into the metals. Drop out of the rates. You're going to go all the way down to the bottom of the asset class list, listeners. You're going to hit the metals. They're probably going to hang out in Precious, but we'll see. Maybe Todd has other thoughts. Uh, Todd, what is lighting up your tape in the world of the metals this week, sir? Always gold. Gold always tends to be at the top there somewhere. Again, it it really gives you a, a good, clear picture. Now, while gold... Prices have been in decline now. Uh, some interesting things happening in gold when you when you compare it to what's happening in silver. I know we don't like to crisscross our our metals, but the gold silver ratio probably something that is hidden in the back of the filing cabinet that people don't really watch is a great indicator. It peaked during COVID at 123. So that's a pretty a pretty incredibly high number. Bottomed out in February of last year at about 64. And now it's back to 90. So gold really outperforming its little brother silver over the last year or so. And while the dollar's up about 12% this year, the dollar index that is, gold only down about 6%. So gold is hanging in there despite the fact that we continue to have a lot of obstacles against it, whether it be higher rates, higher yields, uh, and a stronger dollar, gold is down, but should be down a lot more based on historicals. Well, let's see what we are getting out here in the shiny stuff this week, listeners. Gold having a decent week, 173,000 contracts. Not the most active week we've ever seen, but nothing to sneeze at either. And of that 173,000 contracts, the most active contract looks like it's the uh, the contract going away in five days with 20% of the paper. So we're not going to hang out there, listeners. We'll go a little bit farther afield let's go out here to the set contract that did 19 percent of the paper so we can hang out there as well by the way gold right now listeners right around a 1720 kind of depends where you're looking that front portion of the curve that front future 1713 we get out to september almost a 1721 about a 1720.9 that's up about 9.3 points about half a percent on the week what is gold vol right now you might ask not much, 1641. It's off about another half a point this week. In terms of skew, we got 3.3% bid to the puts last week, 2.9% bid. This week's the puts coming in a little bit. The calls, two tenths of a percent bid last week. So not a lot of love for the calls. This week, a little bit more juice, one and a half percent bid there. And then in terms of the active contracts this week, looks like. It is the 18 quarter calls going up out here in November that were leading the dance. They did 12,688 contracts. Interesting. 18 quarters. Looks like it might be a bit of a, once again, upside flies. (laughs) We've got the 18 quarters doing 12,600 today. Also have the 17 halves doing about 7,000 today. And then we have the 1900s doing 6,500 contracts today. So it looks like we have pretty much a roughly 6,500 by almost 13,000, 12,600 fly going up. It's a 17 half, 18 quarter, 1,900, one by two by one fly listeners. Uh, Pretty symmetrical outside of that. Nothing else crazy to it. So another, another day that ends in Y, another crazy upside fly here in the shiny stuff. This one not quite as outrageous. Listen, this is the eighteen quarters is the is the main strike, and it starts at seventeen half. So this compared to some of the other outlandish upside trades we've seen in gold, which are pretty much every week at this point, listeners, we've seen things well north of the two thousand strike. So seventeen half, that isn't the most outrageous thing I've ever seen out there. I can kind of get behind that one. Let's see what else we've got going on out here. We've got. Uh, 1730 calls going out in about five days. These doing about 5,500 contracts, almost all of that today, 4,900 going up today. So a lot of interest in the 1730s going out in five days. Again, we're at about a 1713 in that front future there. So they got a bit of a ways to go to get to a 1730, but intriguing to see so many of those piling in there as well let's look really quickly if we see any other weird aberrant prints the metals are known for those on occasion listeners we got the march 19 halves going up 2,000 times this week as well as the 2300s and the 2200s going up a thousand times each all that today actually so if that's a vertical that's a weird one 19 half 2200 2300 (laughs) 
It's uh, almost one to one. So uh, strange strikes afoot yet again, this time in March, listeners, uh, with the 19 halves going up 1,310 times, the 2,300s going up 1,000 times, and the 2,200s also going up 1,000 times today. Meanwhile, though, listeners, it's time to bring you folks onto the show a little bit of your futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for Futures Options Feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at the options You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app. Available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody. Welcome to your Futures Options feedback. Let me just pay off some quick Questions of the week that we had on the show last week, then get your thoughts on this week's uh, this week's question. Last week, we asked you guys which spread with wings it's finding its way into your trading arsenal right now. I gave you three choices, iron condor, iron butterfly, traditional butterfly, or other. And iron condor took it just barely, 43.8% choosing iron condor. Butterfly, which I thought would take it, getting number two with 37.5%. Iron fly, 12.5% and then other 6.3%. Uh, this week, Todd, we're asking folks, you know, we've seen a nice pop in equities and crypto. By the way, crypto, the one complex we didn't get to. We did just about everything else on the show this week. We did rates. We did equities. We did ags. We did FX. We did metals. We did, I mean, you, we did everything you could think about on the show. Energy. Uh, so crypto, the one thing that didn't make it on the show this week, listeners. But we're asking you this week. We've seen a nice pop. In equities and crypto over the past week, are you buying back in at these levels or is there still more blood to come? Gave you four choices. I'm buying equities here. I'm buying crypto here. I'm buying both here. Or there's more blood to come. Mr. Todd, uh, what are your thoughts? And then more importantly, what do you think our audience is voting for, sir? I think equities is going to be a very mixed bag. Uh, I think a lot of those that maybe had gotten out at better, more profitable levels, uh, you know, when you got to the summer, you know, you got to when you got to the spring and the summer and equities seem to be rolling. Uh, if you didn't get out then and you're still holding on, you're probably going to be a wait and see type. Uh, cryptos are interesting, though. Bitcoin especially. We, we did dip below 20,000. Uh, now we're back above it. That seems to be a very good barometer. If we get back below 20,000, you know, it's probably got a little more to the downside than, you, than you'd hope. So I think, I think more buying in the crypto stage here, not because I, I think crypto is going back to 60,000, but because of the well-defined support down at 20,000 in Bitcoin. All right, let's see what the audience has on the brain, Todd. And right now, with about a day to go, listeners, if you're listening on the podcast, you will still have time to vote. Go to at options to make your voice heard. And right now, 57.1% saying there's more blood to come. So you're not buying anything here. Then you've got a tie for number two with I'm buying equities here and I'm buying both here. So cryptos and equities, both of them at exactly 16.3%. That's that's strange. And then bringing up the rear is crypto, Todd. So uh, a bit of a mixed bag on crypto this week. Again, you have... About a day left to go, listeners, if you haven't written in. A lot of folks weighing in. Uh, Daniel Hoban saying he's buying here and there is more blood to come. So he he's voting for both, I guess. And then Marine Recon saying he needs a fifth option that he never blanking sold. So in which case, um, our condolences, sir. Hopefully you're doing some stuff to mitigate some of that uh, pain. Let's get out here to this question. This is kind of an interesting one. For, I like the handle. Theta Noob. You get points for the handle here. This is an interesting one, Todd. Theta Noob wants to know. It's a bit of a bit of an epic treatise, so buckle in, Todd. <laughs> he says, in an attempt to oversimplify futures trading, from my perspective, trading a futures product like uh, the MES, so the micro e-mini listeners, with a five-point multiple is the same as trading five years of an approximately thirty-eight hundred dollar five shares, I should say, of an approximately thirty-eight hundred dollar stock. Therefore, if I am long one 
uh, MES futures contract, it means I am long five, quote, shares. And if I wish to incorporate a strategy like a covered call to that, I can simply sell one micro e-mini call contract to be covered at a price target that I would like to get out of my long position and collect a modest premium while I wait. Now, I understand the major differences in product assignment, whether it's cash settled for the quarterly or futures contract if it's the weekly, and the price is determined by the view op, so the value-weighted average price listeners. However, boiled down to the basics, is a covered call on a one micro e-mini futures options contract approximately the same as a covered call on 100 shares of SPY, except for the notional value difference, margin requirement, assignment price, and product settlement. <laughs> There's a lot of differences there. <laughs> Thanks for taking the time to read my question. After reading it over, I realize it's a lot to unpack. Yeah, you put a, a, packed a lot of living into that question there, Theta New. <laughs> So basically, Todd, uh, he wants to know if he buys a one lot of the micro e-mini futures and then writes a covered call on it, is it the same as him doing a covered call on 100 shares of SPY, sir? What do you have to say for him? That's a lot to unpack there, Mark. Um, <laughs> I do agree with you. I, th- I think at this point, the future side gives you a little more exposure for a little less down. Obviously, you have margin requirements there, whereas the SPY, you're going to be actually paying the premium and you're going to have to be, if you're going to buy an underlying and you're going to sell the, the call against it, it you know, the, the pricing is going to be a little bit different. Um, as far as the question, is it the same as buying one mini uh, micro e-mini versus buying one uh, SPY. Am I correct in, in that? Yes, yes. 100, and, and 100 and, shares of SPY. He says 100 shares of SPY, which is Well, because if you're doing the calls, if you're doing, if you're doing the, call, if you're doing the yes. calls, that, 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 makes the, that makes it equal. Um, w- would it be the same is, on a cost basis or is it the same on a notional basis or is it the same on a, uh, on a movement basis? Because they're all, I mean, there, there's going to be some differences in there. I just want to make sure we're answering the question. Weirdly enough, he understands that there is a notional difference, so he gets that. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's funny. He on one hand he acknowledges the many differences, <laughs> the notional value difference, the margin requirement, the assignment price difference, and the product settlement difference. But outside of all those differences, <laughs> he wants to know if they are if they are approximately the same. <laughs> Without without giving any any sort of my fiduciary responsibility is I don't want to give them any bad advice. They sound similar, and I'd have to go into the I'd have to break down the specifications of each of the contracts a little deeper. But they sound very similar. Yeah, Theta Noob, it seems like you're on the right track. With or you've already pointed out most of the differences that I was going to point out to you. Like you mentioned, even the fact that you're talking about if it's a quarterly. Or if it's a regular, what type of exercise and assignment you're going to have there. So you seem like you know all the nuanced differences there. So yeah, I think if we if understanding all that, and I think you sounds like you do, then yeah, I think functionally they are borderline equivalent. Again, with the huge caveat of all the differences that you point out yourself, which are, of course, the uh, notional value difference, the different margin levels, the different assignment price methodology, and the different settlements, if you can get past all those differences, <laughs> then yes, for the most part, they are going to be functionally equivalent. That, that was an interesting one. You guys, we love you folks out there. You guys always bring it with your questions. All right, that's going to do it for this episode of This Week in Futures Options. Mr. Todd, I know your head's probably still spinning from all that craziness with uh, micro e-mini versus spy. But if folks want to reach out to you, check out what you guys have cooking over there in the land of Ambrosino Brothers. Where should they go? What should they do? I can be reached. Uh, my Twitter handle uh, at TJC1539. Uh, my Bloomberg address, uh, tcolvin14 at Bloomberg.net. Um, and I think there's a lot. Again, this these moves that we're seeing, this is not the end. Despite the fact that we're seeing a lot of prices come off, we're seeing some things rally off the lows, this is not the end. There's a lot more price action coming and vol action coming uh, as the Fed continues its onward and upward hiking cycle. There you go. Check them out over there at Ambrosino Brothers. And, of course, you know where to go to check out these reports for yourself and a whole bunch more. CMEgroup.com slash TWIFO is the place to begin that futures options journey. Then, of course, from there, 
you head on over to whatever floats your boat, the educational content, some of the great research Blue and Eric and the rest of the team are doing over there on the research side. You could very easily lose many hours over there, but begin your journey, seemegroup.com slash twifo. And then, of course, you know where to go to learn more about all things small caps, recon. How does that impact the market? What's going on with the COVID impact on the market? What's behind this massive rally we've seen in small caps this week? And a whole bunch more. FTSE Russell, FTSE Russell.com is the place to go to begin that journey. Of course, give them a follow on the old Twitter while you're at it as well, at FTSE Russell, all one word on behalf of Mr. Todd and everybody over there in CME land and the FTSE Russell folks and indeed myself. I want to thank all of you out there for listening today. We'll be back again tomorrow, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern for volatility views. And then after that, exclusively for all you cool kids in the secret club, We're back with Options Oddities to break down the week's worth of weird and wild paper on the options front. Then back again next week, all the way through to next Thursday, another episode of This Week in Futures Options. Stay safe out there, everybody. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME Group. For more information, please visit ftserussell.com, cboe.com, and cmegroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.